Welcome, everybody, to a very special show, and it's always a special show when we have my friend Eric G. Wilson joining us. Eric, how are you? Miguel, I'm always in a good mood when I see you, my friend. Nice to be Uh, back. Always great to see you, and yes, from the backdrop, uh, which is kind of unusual, you may be wondering what we're doing, but we are going to talk about a very special movie and a very special director, and that is John Borman's Point Blank. And Eric recently released a book, which was an excellent read, and uh, will give you a lot of insight into Hollywood, uh, the human mind, and as we'll find out, even Gnosticism, believe it or not. <laughs> Lee Marvin shooting away is Gnostic, but it is. Uh, so, Eric, tell us how you came uh, about to writing this book. Sure. So I, I grew up um, in a time when the laconic tough guy sort of held sway over Hollywood, not only Lee Marvin, but Clint Eastwood and Steve McQueen. And my dad was a man's man and he, he, he loved these guys. So I grew up watching these movies on TV um, and particularly Marvin's The Dirty Dozen uh, was a big hit for my dad. Uh, Dirty Harry, the Eastwood film, Bullet, the McQueen film. So what I'm saying is I had a very soft spot in my heart for Lee Marvin. I liked him better than these other two because I thought he was funny. He was he was ironic and sarcastic, uh, kind of your classic like Han Solo like you know, anti hero. He he didn't really necessarily want to be noble. He wanted to be just kind of a a wise ass. But at the end of the day, <laughs> he, he he would always do the right thing. So. That's one strain, just my, my sort of nostalgic affection for Lee Marvin is behind this, but there's a very specific moment that really spawned this book. Well, really, too. So um, I'd never seen Point Blank um, until 2017, and here, here's the context in which I saw the film. I'd just left um, my wife of 24 years, and, and I was traveling um, in London to do some research, and I got into London, I was jet lagged, tried to stay up all day so I could get back on the clock. And I was staying um, in South Bank near the British Film Institute. And there on the marquee showing, oh, uh, Point Blank, starring Lee Marvin. Hmm, why not? Why don't I just pop in here and see what the film's about? Well, uh, the film is about uh, this man who's betrayed by those he thought loved him and how he's trying to recover his humanity. So even though it's a film that is about violence and crime. I saw it very much as a kind of deep study of, of trauma and of a man trying to, to find his way out of trauma to heal himself. Now, I'm not saying I was traumatized, but I definitely felt alone and broken at that moment. And, and so the film spoke to me on, on a very, very deep level, and I became obsessed with the film after that. So I was watching it probably you know two, three, four times a year until two years ago, the British Film Institute asked me if I would review a manuscript for their series, BFI Classics, on Eraserhead, the David Lynch film. Whoa. (laughs) And you and I have talked about David Lynch a good bit. We've talked about Eraserhead, one of the great Gnostic films of all time. So I said, sure, I'll be happy to. So I I I review the the manuscript. It's fantastic. It's coming out in book form uh, at some point soon. But when I sent them the manuscript in, I said, hey, I I wouldn't mind pitching you an idea for a BFI Classics. What about Point Blank? And they said, give us what you got. So that that's the that's the backstory of this film. Yeah, partial nostalgia, partial like a, a real kind of empathetic connection with the character, and partial just uh I don't know, the, the demiurge stood aside and good luck <laughs> emerged with, with a racer head coming my way yet again. Yeah, well, I, I want to talk about there's certainly a connection between Lynch and Borman and certainly Absolutely. this movie and so much. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, my dad was into these action movies. Uh, I wasn't allowed to watch them, but 
you know us boys you know my dad would be sitting in his bed watching and i would like sneak into the bottom of it that's how i watch godfather at eight all these movies in point blank and of course sometimes it would bite me in the ass i'd I'd, like sneak in and my dad's watching like kolchak the you know night stalker so then i'd have nightmares all night long i was like why did i watch this but this movie is, uh, do you want to talk briefly about the summary of this movie? Because, again, most people, when sure. I was a kid, I was like, well, this is a fun action movie. That's all I knew. So so this this film, um, it's having a major uh, renaissance. It didn't do terribly well at the box office. It did somewhat well critically, but it came out the same year as Bonnie and Clyde, 67. So it kind of got pushed to the side. It's really prominent now because directors like Quentin Tarantino and, and, and Michael Mann and Steven Soderbergh have really championed the film. And it's been a profound influence on their films. But briefly, the, 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 the film is about a man, uh, the Lee Marvin character named Walker. Uh, he's on a heist with a good friend of his named Mal. He's married to a woman named Lynn. And Mal and Lynn betray him. Um, they, they take the money from the robbery. They shoot him, leave him for dead. And the film opens with him sort of waking up in a jail cell because the robbery took place on Alcatraz, the, the deserted prison where drug drop, drug, drug drops are, are made. <laughs> so, so, so he wakes up in this prison cell. He's been shot and he's like, what happened? It's almost like the beginning of, 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 of Edgar Allan Poe short story, like, like the pit in the pendulum. Like, who am I? What has happened? He's been so traumatized. It's like he's has kind of partial amnesia. So the, the film really is the story of his trying not so much to seek revenge against Mal, his friend, and Lynn, his wife, but recover the money that was taken from him, $93,000. So it becomes kind of his grail, if you will. He seems to think that if I can get my $93,000 back, then I'll be whole. Now, who would he get the money from? There's this crime syndicate known as the organization, and they seem to control everything, uh, legal and illegal. It's, it's, they're, they're like a, a capitalist corporation, but it's essentially the, the mafia. So what Walker Marvin does is kind of work his way up the chain of command um, of the organization, trying to get to the top guy and get his money back. So along the way, he's doing some real kind of badass sort of stuff. But interestingly, he never kills anyone. He, he ends up like roughing up telephones and cars and, and intercoms, um, scaring these dudes into giving him the information he wants. So, so the film is kind of interesting in that it's hyper-violent, but in a, in a kind of blackly comic way, as if this over-the-top violence is kind of making fun of hyper-masculine violence. So that's one strand of the film. Another one is his wife, Lynn, kills herself um, early on by a pill overdose. She feels so guilty for betraying him. And he kind of gets a thing going with her sister, played by Angie Dickinson, brilliantly. Um, Her name in the film is is Chris. So it's like she's trying to heal him in a way, trying to rekindle his humanity, trying to pull him away from his revenge quest, um, possibly into a romantic relationship with her. So those are the two main strains. They kind of come to the head, come to a head near the end of the film. And there's a very surprise ending that I'm not going to give away. Um, But I'll say this, that the film is beautifully shot. It's shot in L.A. of 1967. You'll not see more gorgeous camera work kind of catching L.A. as as kind of an urban wasteland, but also like a strange, almost alien landscape. Um, The the fashion in the film is amazing. It's like 60s fashion at its height. Uh, Marvin is, is as Marvin as he'll ever be, very stoic, uh, very understated. Um, Angie Dickinson coming off her great performance in Rio Bravo opposite John Wayne is flirtatious, but smart and compassionate and tough. Uh, it's, it's got everything. And, and also it's very, very trippy. I mean, I mean, the way it plays around with time and space. And that's one reason I think the film wasn't a commercial hit because it, it, it's really kind of trying to explore how a traumatized person might experience time meaning he probably can't distinguish between past and present very well. So there are a lot of flashbacks and you're not quite sure, is that a flashback or not? And then there's some leap forwards. You're not quite sure if that's a leap forward or not. So the disorientation in time, I would say is formally appropriate because again, it's trying to capture how a a broken, fragmented, traumatized man would experience time. 
So that's that's a, a, a an intro to the film. And I, I can't say strongly enough, watch it if you're listening to this show. Yeah, it's it's a classic. It's timeless. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. way ahead of its times because again, mm-hmm. it's dealing with something that it's dealing with trauma, which is normal mm-hmm. today, but you didn't see it back then. And how, like you said, trauma breaks time. Time doesn't exist. All, all of us who've been traumatized are in one point of time with yeah. our shadow, with our complexes. There's no, we're possessed by the past and all that. And this makes sense too, because as I was reading your book, um, I was at a coffee shop and I'm reading the beginning and I'm reading about how Lee Marvin in World War II was a soldier. Mm-hmm. He was in Japan. He was part of this group of, what, 267 guys going up to the Taipan Mountain. And Mm -hmm. the Japanese just slaughtered them. He got shot. He survived. But he was, as you said, he was in his little raft boat shooting at Japanese, almost dying. And he survived. And, of course, that was was traumatic. But, unfortunately, Eric, you and I have tools in the 21st century. But back then, poor Lee, like so many in World War II, were like, all right, just suck it up and go on with your life. But of course, this haunted Marvin, which made him the actor that he is, right? Perfect for this role. Well, the the reason he took this role is because of his World War II experience. As you're you're saying, Miguel, it it, it was an assault on a hill on the island of Sapan in Japan during World War II. He was a Marine, private. And he was one of the the lead soldiers on this charge up the hill. And he was shot in the back and in the foot and he probably would have been killed, but another man was shot and fell on top of him. And so he Mm. didn't take any more bullets, but yes, out of, out of a company of 200 odd soldiers, about 12 survived and he was one of them. So he admitted that he had survival survivor's guilt. Um, But not only that, he, he was a, 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 a sort of raft sniper. He would he would hover in these rafts off off the the coast of these islands in Japan, and he would he would snipe. So he, he killed people. So he's coming off um, Cat Blue um, in '66, for which he won the Academy Award. So he's like the most famous actor in the world at this point. And John Borman has only directed one film, a kind of mediocre film about the Dave Clark Five. It's kind of like a knockoff of Hard Day's Night. Right. And so the fact that Marvin took on Borman and this script was solely because he said, I see in the main character, whose name is Walker in the film, um, Parker in the novel from which the film comes, I see in him a man who's been traumatized as I was traumatized, shot, felt betrayed, and is trying to do whatever he can to get his humanity back. And he said to Borman, I feel that I've lost my humanity I feel that I'm like an automaton. I'm just going through the motions of life and maybe in playing this role, I can, I can work through some of that. So acting, acting is therapy. Now we don't think of someone like Marvin or Eastwood or McQueen or John Wayne as being sort of, you know, Marlon Brando, like method actors. (laughs) But, But I think this was for Marvin, a kind of method acting exercise. Um, and you're right, Miguel. I feel like you know you and I. We've been very frank about our own mental health um, right. issues on this show. I, I certainly haven't suffered trauma like like being a soldier, but but I think if you, you do have um, depression, clinical depression, right. there 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 is a you. I, I'll speak for myself. It's difficult to take the present moment. It's it's difficult to find a connection sometimes with the present moment because because you're so like preoccupied with your own agitation or anxiety or, or mania or, or depression to where you, you almost, I almost feel like I'm living in another world, <laughs> kind, of, kind yeah. of like on another I'm an alien who's been put down on this world. And I'm trying to figure out how to negotiate it. Um, and time does become weird. Uh, you, it, it really is difficult to say, okay, I really feel a, a, a palpable connection to this present moment now when I'm so consumed by something else. So that's why I think in the film, it's so important that you have the Angie Dickinson character. Who's, who's trying to break into his revenge quest. Anytime his revenge quest is filmed, there are tons of flashbacks, which kind of symbolizes the fact that he's doing the same thing over and over again. Because that's what revenge really is. I mean, if you're consumed by revenge, you're just doing, you're reenacting a past trauma over and over and over again, a past violence. Mm-hmm. And, and she's trying to pull him out of that. Like, hey, look at look at me. I, you know, I think you're great. I'm, I'm sorry you were in a bad marriage with my sister. Um, so that's the great pull of the feel. So if we can, if we can go Gnostic if we want to a little bit. I mean, the, the organization 
in this film is very much like you know the the, the archons and the, the demiurge. They're they're the puppet masters. They're pulling the strings to the point where almost everyone in this film is connected with the organization mm -hmm. and almost like a Gnostic hero. Marvin is trying to come to life again by breaking through the, the archons and throwing off the demiurge. And you see Angie Dickinson's kind of as a Sophia character, exactly. kind of helping him along and, and leading him. Now I'm reducing the film to a Gnostic allegory. It's not that, but yet it is. I mean, it really has, it has that kind of depth psychological power to it, that it does indirectly pull forth these great myths of the Gnostic tradition that you and I are so interested in. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, I was saying I, I was at a coffee shop reading it. And again, synchronicity, uh, mm -hmm. a gentleman was, uh, I, I live in the middle of nowhere. So the odds are small, but a gentleman said, Oh, point black, my favorite all time movie. No what way. are the odds I would run into somebody? <laughs> and great. I'm like, yeah. And I was like, Oh my God, Lee Marvin is something else. And he immediately went like, Oh yeah. He had PTSD he used to oh, sleep yeah. with a machete under his, his uh, pillow and all these things. And of course, as you write, he had a he was self medicating with alcohol, oh, so I had a great conversation with this gentleman. Hopefully, I, I gave him my website, so yeah. hopefully he's listening. But, I hope uh, so. But what are the odds? Huh? That's and, amazing. Uh, yeah, we had a great. I told him about your book. Wrote Love down that your book. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, the universe is working in our favor. But it, yeah, it, yeah, I think it is a Gnostic allegory because again, Eric, again, you and I have talked about this through yeah. years, but. People always would say, even Irenaeus and all these guys, what's up with the Gnostics? They're always writing about Genesis. It's just pumping out. What are they doing? They're insane. They're yeah. arrogant. But what they were doing in Young Notice is they realized that they were looking at this trauma, the trauma of creation, birth, the fall. Mm -hmm. And they weren't like everybody else. Oh, we'll just move on, suck it up and move on mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. apocalypse or something. They were so obsessed because they understood 2000 years ago that this trauma is not only painful, but it will literally fragment our reality, our mm -hmm. personality, will disassociate. So yeah. I think uh, uh, Point Blank really captures mm -hmm. it with, like you said, it's surrealism. We don't know, like he's making love to Angie Dickinson, but then the character starts yeah. switching and he's going back to being shot over mm -hmm. and over mm -hmm. again. It's, mm -hmm. it's, the same, it's the same vibe. It's what the Gnostics were about is trauma healing. Well, it, it, it is it is the, the vicious, vicious repetition of trauma, where even when he does is in a moment where he seems to be fully connected with Chris, Angie Dickinson, like you say, he suddenly pictures himself making love to his sister in, the, in this sort of hallucination. And then he pictures his nemesis, Mal, making love to Chris. And then he envisions Mal making love to his wife. I mean, so it, it, there's a real sense that he's living, he's living retrospectively. He's living backwards because of, of what you say. And this is so key to the whole, I mean, in, in, in Gnostic cosmology, existence begins with a trauma, right? With, with, right. with, with a breakage or fragmentation, uh, Adam being torn into, for instance, um, the, the, the abyss being torn in really you know, placed in, into into two you know, night light night and dark um, all mm -hmm. that and but that also happens for each of us when we're born there's a sense that we are at odds with ourselves and we are alone we are abandoned and we're looking for for that healing and and Jung was so articulate about this he he was able to draw on those those gnostic symbols so powerfully um, to try to articulate a narrative from by which we can move from brokenness to wholeness and i think that's really what the what the motion of the film is and, and that's why the ending is so shocking uh when when you when you get there again i hesitate to spoil it because i really want people to, to to get the shock of that but the ending's a little bit like the ending of say um sixth sense or usual suspects or fight club where what you thought was the case the whole movie right. is not the case at all but yet kind of is. So it's almost like we ourselves are put in the same position as, 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 as Walker, where we're in this kind of cinematic world and we think it's one thing and then it turns out to be something else. And it puts us in a very strange position um, as interpreters and experiencers of, of the film. Oh, exactly. And it's, yeah. uh, and the ending is very ambiguous. And of course you're, I love it because yeah. you're wondering 
does this really happen? I mean, you wonder, uh, like uh, the gentleman I was talking to, he's like, could it be one of those death dream literally devices where, you know, the yeah. character dies and he's he has a few seconds to live the life he thought mm -hmm. he was going to live, <laughs> but then he doesn't. That's also a possibility, right, Eric? Well, it, well, it is. Uh, many people have connected this film to the great uh, short story by Ambrose Pierce, An Occurrence at Al Creek Bridge, where a soldier is getting ready to be hung, and yeah. suddenly you think he's broken free and he's going to be reunited with his wife. And no, no, that's that's what happened within like the three seconds between standing on the bridge and and dying. And 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 one could offer that interpretation. Um, Borman himself said, well, it's a possibility, but it really doesn't matter. He said, what you see is what you see, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I kind of <laughs> like. Like, let's not worry about appearance versus reality, dream versus truth. Let's just pay attention to the story. But I will say this. If this is a kind of dream, one would think it would be a wish fulfillment, like it is in the current St. Al Creek Bridge. And it's mm -hmm. not. <laughs> It's, no, it's, no. It's, it's it's not not like at scratching all scratching your head yeah. like yeah. What? <laughs> who won and, who lost i am <laughs> and 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 the 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 deep problem of 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 this idea or this this possible interpretation is that what you realize better than the film is that when when walker thinks he is doing his most to overturn the organization he's actually unwittingly doing his best to support the organization all right and, and, and so this film is in conversation with movies like The Truman Show, uh, to some extent, or, or, or The Matrix, to some extent, where you know, what you think is like raw, visceral authenticity on the side for good. And then suddenly you're like, oh, no, I've been a tool all along <laughs> for, the, for the wrong side. And you know, luckily, in for the, the protagonists in the films, The Matrix and Truman Show, there is a kind of release at the end of those films, which is very satisfying to audiences, it's not quite that simple um, at the end of Point Blank. Yeah, he's definitely obsessed with that $93,000. I mean, like you said, it is, speaking of John Borman, who directed yeah. Excalibur, I kept thinking if he finds his $93,000, $93, he's going to be running, you'll hear like Carmina Burana in the background. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you're going through the movie, are you going to get, it's like, He's lost all sense of everything. Somehow he thinks yeah. that this is the philosopher's stone, yeah. right? And yes, he love, does. Uh, being free, all this other things mm -hmm. doesn't matter except for that 93,000. Yeah. And he doesn't care how he gets it. Who lives, who dies, it doesn't matter. So I'm glad you brought up the the connection with Excalibur. It's, it's, it's deep. Um, Borman, his very first film made for the BBC, he was a documentary filmmaker, but he did make one live action film called The Quarry. And it's about a, a sculpture named Arthur King who, who, who wants to take a block of stone and carve it into the shape of what his personal grail would be. Um, so after he makes this film, he, he does catch us if you can. And he's invited to Hollywood um, to pitch movies to big time producers, mainly because the great critic Pauline Kael gave Catch Us If You Can, the Dave Clark Five film a decent review and he keeps pitching. I want to do a film, a modern King Arthur. I want to do a, I want to do a modern King Arthur. And all the producers is like, nah, man, we, no, we don't want <laughs> you to do that. We don't want you to do that. So it does point blank. And, but he is fascinated by the quest. I mean, point blank is a quest film. Mm -hmm. And it really is about a man who sees the 93,000 as his grail. You're exactly right. And, and it turns out it, it's, it's not, it's a misguided quest. And then you see, uh, I, 74, I think, it's either 72 or 74 is Deliverance, another Borman film, which right. is a, a quest film. These these four men from Atlanta going to the deep Appalachian mountains on a canoe trip, trying to recover what they think is their lost manhood. Um, and there again, like the alpha male of that bunch, played by Burt Reynolds in his breakout role, playing Lewis, mm -hmm. ends up becoming injured and impotent, um, as if kind of traditional manhood isn't enough. So, so there's a way in which Borman is fascinated by the quest, but the quest can be ironic. Um, the idea of like, if I can just get this thing to prove my manhood and virility, I'll be full. Well, Borman seems to say, well, you're forgetting the feminine a little. I mean, he's, he's very aware of this kind of idea of a, an androgynous sense of, of wholeness. So then, of course, we go to Excalibur which I would say is a more alchemical than Gnostic film. I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. the, the philosopher, and I totally agree with that. It's all about you know, what comes up out of the chaos of, mm -hmm. of the lake and, and the earth. And you see the knights early on led by Uthor, Arthur's father, have armor like beasts. 
And then when Arthur and Lancelot have the round table, the, 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 the armor is like birds. I mean, it's this, this sense of like you come up from matter. That's where you get your power. Um, but it's very much, again, about this, uh, this idea of, of the quest. Um, and I think, well, I, I know for a fact that, that Borman said he, that the Yo slash Fairfax character, if you see the film, you'll know who this guy is. He's the guy who keeps showing up every time Walker meets one of his foes. He just shows them and says, here's your next foe. Yeah. And I wonder, like, how does he know all this? Borman said he, he reminds him of a Merlin. He says he, he's like my Merlin figure in Excalibur. And gosh, Miguel, we're not even talking about Zardoz. I don't know if we want to get into that one. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can do later. Yeah, we, we could do a whole show. <laughs> Speaking of completely Gnostic, crazy. hands down, yeah, yeah, Borman yeah. did, you know, tapped into the Nag Hammadi mm-hmm. library. We've got Zardoz. But yeah, that's interesting how the character appeared. That there, I want to bring in, again, another Gnostic, David Lynch, because that reminds me of David Lynch. You'll be watching a movie and this character will appear Mm-hmm. And you know this character is not a deep, full character. It's mm-hmm. a literary device to get the protagonist. Mm-hmm. And it's fine. You know that's what they like the cowboy in Mulholland Drive. He has a purpose. It's yeah. a godly yeah. purpose. And he's there. He's a he's not even a real character. Yeah. That's what I thought about Yo slash Fairfax. And yeah. then I thought a lot. I mean, in your book, you talk a lot. Uh, and we you mentioned, you know, uh, movies or directors that point blank has influence from uh, memento uh quentin tarantino's reservoir dogs uh so many films and i saw those in point blank but i also saw a lot of lynch bringing back in monholland drive because it's in monholland drive is this fragmentation of betty and they all kind of come through and sometimes betty is making love to this person sometimes and you're wondering what is going on and even the ending is very am- ambiguous and so forth and, and lynch is like borman they, when people ask him can you summarize the your movies like well i did i made the movie that's yes. the summary that's, yeah. that's I right. the movie is, yeah I, I don't work for western union i'm like I'm here. <laughs> and, and lynch doesn't like to talk about influences either i mean he's been very closed mouth about influences um because ultimately he believes he he makes his greatest films without influences like he says i go down to the bottom of the ocean and the, the ocean of ideas and i find them but i can't i can't help but think that the, that i mean i don't know that lynch had this film in the back of his mind but you're right the similarities are yeah so- i would bet my soul right? i would bet ninety three thousand oh. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice i mean it's an la film like Mulholland drive and, it, and it's very much aware of like locating characters in specific la locations um in this film, the characters are sort of engulfed by these huge cityscapes, um, like we mentioned. Uh, whereas in Mulholland Drive, Lynch will show like the road signs, like Vine, like 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 locating characters in Hollywood mythology, like Sunset. I mean, but but they're both very much about the city as as a place of of confinement. And you're right. There's these characters kind of seeking fame or liberation or vitality. The Betty character in this environment and and failing and you and the dream becomes more real than real and then, then reality comes i mean it's like the first two-thirds of that film is just a gripping sort of noirish thriller and then suddenly a blue box appears and that whole narrative gets sucked into it and then, then like the last third the same characters but they look different and they're doing yeah, different yeah. things and it's shot in a very kind of um saturated kind of flat light whereas the earlier film is like this really vibrant in other words the the dream looks like realism and 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 the and the realism looks like like dream i mean that's classic lynch and this film is doing that i mean absolutely and so so the cowboy kind of seems to come from somewhere else in lost highway the mystery man played by robert blake kind of seems to come from someone else so yeah and, and even to a certain extent frank in blue velvet i mean these are like characters who are like vital forces who kind of transgress the narrative to make stuff happen um and then kind of go away i mean i mean frank doesn't really go away but what i'm saying is for for the for the character jeffrey the Cal McLaughlin character frank's a kind of messenger calling him to a another kind of life right. for good or for good or ill um so yeah i hadn't I, yeah i think you're right on with that 
Yeah, that's what I saw. And there's so much that uh, Point Blank did. Like uh, you're right, it was mm-hmm. first film done in Alcatraz after mm-hmm. it was uh, mm-hmm. it was abandoned or closed. It was the first film to what did you say? It, every scene has a dominant co- color, and that wasn't done before. I mean, it's just groundbreaking in many ways. So Borman had been shooting in black and white his whole film career. Uh, his first Hollywood film, Catch Me If You Can, the Dave Clark film, was shot in black and white. And he wanted to shoot this film in black and white. But but the producers said, no, we can't do that. He says, well, OK, I'll still try to deal in monochrome, though. <laughs> so in each scene, like like in the first scene when Walker's talking to his wife, Lynn, everything is a shade of gray. Everything in the room, everything being worn is a shade of gray. There's another famous scene where um, one of the leaders of the organization, one of the crime bosses is in his office with all his henchmen. Everybody's dressed in a shade of green. Mm -hmm. Uh, And of course the producer's like, this will look terrible. It'll all look the same. But, but Borman knew because of the emulsion of the film, some grays, greens look gray and some greens look yellow and some look kind of blue. So it's, you get differentiation of color, but yet there's this kind of subtle idea that you're in this world of of this particular hue which takes on powerful symbolism. Um, the gray suggesting ghostliness and, and, and death and fog, uh, much like um, Ma- Madeline Elster's dress in the vertigo, that gray dress right, suggests right. a kind of fog. But then in that green room where the organization holds its meetings, the green suggesting money, the kind of money that Walker wants, but also suggesting a kind of sickness at the same time. So it's, it's interesting to track the monochrome throughout the film, but then notice that Walker's wearing a different suit in almost every scene, which is not the same as the color. As the film goes on, his colors are at odds with the monochromes. So it's a way of Borman trying to track the vitality, if you will, returning to um, Marvin. And his suits are amazing. (laughs) So cool. (laughs) Yes, indeed. And here is my sort of lynching connection. It's completely mine, Eric. But yes. uh, you talk about uh, after the movie was shot, all the studios are what, and all the studio guys, their jaws are down. To, they're like, this cannot go out to the pub. It's too, even for the 60s, it is yeah. way too trippy, psychedelic. And they're free. But there was some lady, I forget her name, but she was an editor, but she mm-hmm. had power and in yes. fact it reminds me of, again of the of the midget in Mulholland Drive who can simply no film or you know he can just say a word and remember the film is not going to be done unless this girl yeah. is, and this lady simply said nope you don't touch this film it's perfect as it is and I was like wow this is Hollywood this lady was like this yeah. film's going to go out as it is I don't care about the presidents and studio executives this is it. <laughs> so, so like, you're absolutely right. So like, like Lynch, you know, Lynch, the only film Lynch ever made didn't have final cut on was Dune. And, and you know, Dune has some fans. I, mean, I get, you, it, I get you, people angry at me if I say anything wrong. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like if you criticize Christopher Nolan or uh, David Lynch, yeah. you get, I get all these angry emails. It's like, come on. It's not, a, yeah. it's okay. No, it's okay. It's it's static. It's interesting. But, you know, Villeneuve's is so much more interesting. But but that's another conversation. But yeah. Lynch is, even though he's always had Final Cut, aside from that film, has always clashed with the studio because his mm. films are so strange. So so here's Borman, first time with like a working with movie stars. And throughout the shooting, the producers were trying very hard to shut it down. And so there's one story Borman tells where the producer calls him in and has a psych- psychologist in the <laughs> office. Because he wants the psychologist to deem him insane. So he has grounds to fire him from the film because he's getting, he's like, you're shooting this scene in all green. That doesn't work. Or, you know, why aren't you showing any, any time connections? Why are you jumping around? Who's that? What? And, and so luckily for, for um, Borman, Marvin said, if I take this film, Borman gets final cut. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay. So he had final cut, but still, as you say, when he finally turned in his final cut or what for him was the final cut, the studio, the execs were like, we've got to find a way to, to, to block this film. And sort of this, this very wizened veteran film editor who'd been around since the thirties and forties, her name is escaping me right now. Um, 
she sat and watched the film and Borman says she was an, was a bit older woman at this time. So she had cold feet. She had like a little electric heater at her feet. Yeah, yeah. Coming, and she watched it and everybody sat silently for like a minute. And she just said, you don't touch that film. You're not going to cut a thing uh, over my dead body. Will you yeah. touch it? She said, and there it is that the, the film happened. And again, it, 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 it did. I made like nine million, which is a respectable uh, profit at that at that time. It, it wasn't a flop, um, but again, I, I think it was going up as as a film scene is kind of hyper violent. It was going against Bonnie and Clyde. With, yeah, you can't yeah, win against. That was Bonnie a phenomenon. And that was yeah, that was that was kind of the the beginning of so called New Hollywood. Mm-hmm. So it couldn't really compete with that. Um, and that's a great film too. I mean, it's a it's a. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I like I like Point Blank better, but it's a it's a it's a good film. And then he did the Dirty Dozen, so that's took up all the air. The Lee Marvin air. Well, that's that's right. so iconic. The same that's year, right. Dirty Dozen comes out. So so Marvin's competing against himself essentially that year. I mean, yeah, he was he was really at the top of his game um, after this. It, he made another film with Borman right after Point Blank called Hell in the Pacific, which is an interesting film where Marvin is trapped on an island um, in near Japan. The war's going on. There's a Japanese soldier also trapped on the island. They're deserted on this island, just a Japanese soldier and an American soldier. And it's just them working, you know, fighting and hating, but then kind of working it out a little bit. And at the very end, they finally become friends and they found this stash of food and they're like having this little feast. And just as they toast, a missile comes and blows them up. (laughs) I mean, it's terrible. I mean, it's just, I mean, so there's Borman again, like sort of pulling the rug out from under you, but also, I mean, this Borman was brilliant at depicting violence mm-hmm. and he was brilliant at depicting traditional masculinity, you know, heroism, strength, aggression. But I, but I think he saw the limits um, and, and he, he has a kind of gently satirical mode where he says, look, traditional masculinity ignores the feminine. And that's, and, and you see that in Excalibur again, you see oh, it yeah, yeah. that's he's very, very, and you see it in, in deliverance. There are no women in that film. And that's one reason why those men are so disturbed. I, I, I think, think so. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, that Borman kind of has it both ways. And Lynch does this too. I mean, Lynch depicts violence very powerfully and effectively, but also, but not just for the sake of it, but to show not only how destructive it is, but to trying to explore where it comes from. And, and, and Lynch, like Borman, I, I think does believe, as Jung does, that this kind of sense of like trying to bring together these different parts of the self, call them masculine or feminine, call them what you will. If you can try to put those in conversation, then you're less likely to want to, as a male, kind of dominate the world. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I always said uh, Excalibur is all about King Arthur underestimating and marginalizing women, Morgana, Guinevere. And thing, when things go bad, he wonders what. It's only till he goes to Guinevere and says, please, I will. you can own me. I will be your yes. man. Take me to be. That's when he becomes yes. Paul, when he sort of right. surrenders to the divine feminine or the feminine. Oh, such a powerful moment. He asks her to forgive him. Yeah, he supplicates. Major moment. Mm. Um, and that's part, of, that's part of what's going on in this film. Um, I think Borman's really smart on causality. Um, one reason I, I think that forgiveness in a way pushes against causality. What does that mean? If I'm going to judge you, if I, I'm going to say, Miguel, Miguel, because you did X to me, then I must do Y to punish you or reward you. That's, that's how causality works. But in forgiveness, it's like, because you did this terrible thing to me, I forgive you. It's like it breaks it breaks that if then. And it's like so time takes a different form. Um, Revenge is very much causal because you did this to me. I will do the same thing to you. I will get you back. And you see someone like like Walker being so controlled by the causality of vengefulness throughout the film. If I can only do this, if I can only do this, if I can only do this. But only those moments in the film where he's kind of playful and doing things like inconsequentially, like that moment where he's in Chris's apartment, he's got her like 
makeup mirror out. He's just kind of messing around with his face. Like, uh-huh. what's? It's just like it doesn't mean anything, but yet it's lovely and charming. It's 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 almost like the organization the 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 organized crime world wants people to be caught up in this idea of causality right um i need to be making money how do i do that if i do these things i will make my money if i do these things i'll make my money it doesn't want people just kind of sitting around playing with makeup kits and so so those (laughs) moments that i mean first of all it's he's being kind of androgynous i mean almost like you know carrie grant and bringing up baby when he's got the 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 robe on um frilly robe very funny i don't feel myself today um, so that's another thing about the film I find really interesting is you have like two different kinds of time, like the, the time of revenge, which is a causal time and the time of like forgiveness and playfulness and inconsequentiality, which could be a time of healing. And I feel like when when Arthur Arthur breaks that causality of like justice and judgment, when he says to Guinevere, I, I forgive you. Very powerful. No, oh, yeah, yeah, beautiful scene. Uh, and another uh, character, and you do talk about it in a recent video. I was on your YouTube channel watching videos all weekend. Uh, and this is for the younger generation, yes. for the Zoomers and the Millennials. You may be scratching your head, like, "Who cares about what these guys blank. talking about?" <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Let, let's give you a character you can relate to, and might not have even existed without Point Blank, mm-hmm. and that is John Wick. John I was like Wick. perfect connect Keanu Reeves. I was like, oh my god, he is Lee Marvin, dead and alive, mad yes, cap, yes. humorous, driven by this insane idea that's ne- never gonna free him anyway, you know. Yeah. All all of it, all of it. So Marvin, we don't know anything about his past or very little, um, except that he got shot by his best friend, his wife left him. That's all we know. Just like with the, the John Wick, we know that his wife died of cancer and some dudes killed his dog. And that's it. So, but neither of them are like deep character studies. Um, it's all, it's almost like, you know, they're just, we're thrown into this world with them where they're trying to negotiate all these rules and all these plans. So you have that, you, you have the, the, the cool suits that Reeves wears. Um, yeah. Marvin wears these amazing suits, but most importantly for me, what you see in Marvin and what you see in um, Reeves is a kind of physical acting that I feel like we don't value enough when we talk about movies. I, I think mm-hmm. we tend to overvalue verbal acting, uh, which you know, someone like Daniel Day-Lewis or, or Robert De Niro, it, take any traditional actor who emotes well with language, who emotes well with the rhythm of his speech. Um, and that's great. But Marvin and Wick Reeves, they kind of harken, harken back to silent film. They harken back to Buster Keaton. And Charlie mm-hmm. Chaplin and, and Harold Lloyd, uh, that they act more with their bodies than with their words. And ultimately, they act with their faces more than with anything else. So they don't say much at all. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, um, but, but Reeves gets better and better and better until by the time we get to four. Not only is he able to say so much with so little, but he, there's, a, there's a humorous side to it. Yeah. There's a kind of slapsticky comic energy going on. And that Marvin shows that brilliantly in this film. Um, like there's the, the one point where Marvin is like one of the guys he's trying to get information from owns a car dealership. And Marvin comes to say, Hey, I want to take a test drive of this car. He doesn't beat the guy up. He just like keeps banging the car up with the guy in it. And it becomes hilarious. Um, in the but same when he way, shoots the phone, he doesn't he get the, the answer. Phone. He likes, he just shoots the phone in front funny. of everyone. So there would, I, I, I maintain there would be no John wick without, point blank and there would be no lee marvin well there would be i'm not you know keanu reeves has done a lot of stuff but keanu reeves as john wick i think is is channeling oh, marvin. Nice. and chas delhelsky says so the director said oh, chas delhelsky says when i grew up my dad owned a lot of eight millimeter silent films and they were just on loop all the time buster keaton charlie chaplin harold lloyd so he has those films in mind in doing those great sequences those great action sequences in john wick which are kind of funny they're slapsticky and he also said we were very much in tune with lee marvin we we wanted to channel that lee marvin energy from mainly point blank so there there it is and that's only one of many ways this film is still alive that's the most prominent way um but also, as, as you've mentioned, Miguel, and, and maybe I have, you take a film like Steven Soderbergh's The Limey, uh, mm-hmm. where the Terrence, Terrence Stamp char- character is British. He comes to America. 
His daughters died under mysterious circumstances, and he's seeking revenge. And Soderbergh himself said that was his remake of Point Blank. Um, you have, as you say, Christopher Nolan's Memento, which is like Point Blank told backwards. <laughs> same film. It's almost exactly the same film. Um, and even though you know Tarantino doesn't doesn't so much have a film that follows out Point Blank plot wise, the whole kind of vibe of the way he deals with criminals and hipness and coolness and style very much comes from Point Blank. But in particular, his characters seem to share a lot with the Lee Marvin character and their kind of laconic hipness um, for, for sure. Michael Mann's um, Heat, uh, oh, the way, the, the, way the, the, the L.A. cityscape is rendered and the kind of stoicism of the De Niro character. So the DNA of this film is um, persists in a, in, a, in a vigorous way in contemporary Hollywood. But mostly, as you say, with the John Wick, if you like John Wick films, you will like Point Blank. <laughs> And there's also that uh, other characteristic. I think this is more of a Cormac McCarthy, mm -hmm. don't stir the beesness. But <laughs> in both films, in John Wick, you see the Russians, oh, we should not have woken it up. You fool, you killed his dog. And people are like, yes. oh, shit, we just woke up this force of nature. Yes. This happens in point blank. Some of the guys in the organization are like, this guy's a pro. We need to bet, even though we really don't know anything what he was before. Yeah, he, you know, yeah. yeah. But they're like, like this guy is gonna, this guy's gonna win. <laughs> he's coming for us. Like he's gonna bring down this whole massive organization one by one. And and let me tell you, when when Marvin acts with focus and aggression, it is horrifying and beautiful at the same time. <laughs> Not just when he you know, shoots the telephone or bangs up the car, but like when he hits someone or like breaks something. It's just like there's so much force in his body, but yet he, he has a kind of grace, uh, like a, like a John wick. And, and you mentioned in one of your emails, Miguel, that the, the, the most iconic scene, I think in the film yeah. shows, uh, Walker, when he first gets his wife's address and you think that's, that's going to help him find Mal, the guy who shot him, he's walking through the Los Angeles airport clumping so hard and walking so fast that the hair is like blowing back on his face and his look is so determined and so terrifying. It is Walker walking. And I, I've held those shoes in my hand. Uh, oh, wow. University. Yeah. The Indiana university um, in Bloomington has the John Borman archive, strangely enough. And when um, Lee Marvin was dying, um, Lee Marvin's wife called Borman. And he said, Lee, Lee wonders, if the, is, is there anything you would like? in his collection. He said, I want those shoes. So Borman had the shoes and now Borman's donated them to the um, university of Indiana. So you can get them from the library. I held them in my hand. They're like size 13. They're massive. Wow. Um, it's just kind of a sacred for me, kind of a sacred object to hold, but that's when, so here's what, here's another thing that I'm, I'm saying in the, in my book is the way the film kind of plays around with genre. What do I mean by that? I mean, obviously, genre is a way to think about, oh, is it a thriller? Is, is it a film noir? Is it this? Is it that? But I'm thinking of genre, I think, in a slightly different sense in that we go see certain films, not because of what they're about, but to see a certain actor play a certain role. So if you grew up when our fathers did, you might say, oh, it's a John Wayne film. Doesn't matter what it is. It's just John Wayne being John Wayne. And we might say that now, oh, it's a Denzel Washington film. And it's Denzel Washington kind of being Denzel Washington. And we're like, yeah, the idea of like certain actors and actresses are able to be like create a character that's so charismatic and interesting. They can just kind of be that character as opposed to Daniel Day Lewis, who loves to transform into something else. <laughs> yeah. right? So I say in some ways, point blank, it's a Lee Marvin film. Audience would have known, like, this is the guy who's in The Professionals, a kind of cool action film from 66. This is the guy who's in The Big Heat. This is the guy who's in The Wild One. This is the guy who's in The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. In other words, tough, strong, laconic. Mm -hmm. But they go see the Lee Marvin film, and it turns out to be something different, right? Because you get to see Lee Marvin not quite being Lee Marvin, kind of undercutting that. So that's just kind of interesting. When he when he walks to the airport, I say this is Marvin at his most Marvin. I mean, it's like <laughs> well, only Marvin. But when he's like putting makeup on, you're like, that's not Lee Marvin being Lee Marvin. There's something else going on here. So I think Borman's aware of that and and play, playing around with that. I'll tell you, someone who else who was good at, good at playing around with that was Stanley Kubrick. Like he would cast say Tom Cruise in Eyes Wide Shut, 
know. and Tom Cruise is playing Tom Cruise, but yet he's kind of you know undercutting that that Tom Cruise, almost like spoofing that Tom Cruise. It makes for a really kind of uncanny effect, where it's like yeah. well, it is and is not at the same time. Yeah, because point blank, like you said, it's sort of it, before it was a thing is deconstructing the detective genre, the revenge genre, the mobster genre, mm -hmm. the love. It's it's throwing them and just putting it in a blender and breaking them and subverting our expectation of all these genres. So again, way ahead of its time, except way course, ahead of his time. Stanley Kubrick was already kind of doing it, but yeah, he was, and, and of course that's what Tarantino does so well. I mean, he's he's, oh, yeah. he's he grew up on all these films in the seventies, all these different genres floating around in his head, mainly the exploitation films. He just kind of throws them all together and you, you see, you see what you get, but Borman was definitely doing that. And not only do we get these kind of American popular American genres like noir and thriller and crime, but also he's drawing from kind of the, the French new wave. So, so directors like Truffaut and Godard and Rene who kind of play around with time and, and, the, and the relationship between dream and reality that's all there. And the, the French film that is most powerfully present in this is um, Jean Rene's Hiroshima Mon Amour. Oh, I love, uh, it. I love this, the book. Amazing, movie, the book. Oh. amazing movie about you know, the, 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 the bomb in Hiroshima and, and people trying to deal with that trauma. Um, but a film that's very much aware of how the problem of trauma is not being able to move forward. It's just endlessly kind of repeating the past. Um, and, and Borman has acknowledged that. He said Rene was a big influence on this film. And also the, um, the writing of, John, of, of Harold Pinter, a, a British playwright and, and screenwriter uh, who's really kind of famous for extremely elliptical, uh, laconic dialogue where people say things without saying them and don't yeah. say anything to say a lot sort of thing. Yeah. Well, as we get more or less towards the end, uh, I wanted to ask you, John Borman, people on the surface, and I did that years ago, we scratching their head and saying, you know, there is, most directors have an aesthetic, whether it's mm -hmm. Tarantino, even Michael Bay has an aesthetic. It's just what directors mm -hmm. are. That's what they yeah. are. But I was like, it, there's no like John Borman aesthetic or it doesn't seem like there's a philosophy. Because mm -hmm. when you compare, again, Sardos, a straight up Gnostic science fiction, mm -hmm. Excalibur, an alchemical, beautiful uh, alchemical expression, point mm -hmm. blank, a deconstruction of and uh, a treatise on mm -hmm. trauma, Deliverance, which is way on somewhere <laughs> on its own yeah. little planet. You go, mm -hmm. does he have, I mean, you mentioned some man's quest, uh, mm -hmm. man's uh, understanding of being a man in this world. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? Is there an aesthetic or something that John unites John Borman? Yeah. So you're, you're right. I mean, an old fashioned way of talking about uh, filmmaking is the auteur theory, as it's known. The idea that certain directors have a kind of signature style mm -hmm. and it's certain signature signature commitments. And certainly Tarantino would fall into that category. No one would fall into that category. Uh, Kubrick would fall into that category. But you look at Borman and, and there are there. Are, I mean, so the, the thematic there are some thematic strings beyond this the you know quest for wholeness he's also very interested in in innocence and or the loss of innocence like an em emerald forest about a young um, boy who grows up among brazilian natives um kind of like a retelling of of, of the tarzan grace tale or hope and glory kind of about john borman as a little boy during during wartime world war ii um but he's also made films about the ira um the general um He's 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 made, made he's made all kinds of films with all mm. kinds of different styles and all kinds of different um, themes. So he he it doesn't make sense to refer to him as a kind of auteur in a way. I mean, the films that you and I have talked about, there's a there's a cogency there, but he did he's made he he has made he's all over the place, mm. <laughs> and I. I have to say, I'm not a fan of all of his films. I mean, The Exorcist 2 is is just not that great. Um, he did that. <laughs> he did. He did. Um, not that great. Um, I just, I, I like five films of his, the ones we've talked about, I think it's five. Um, I think are just masterpieces. But to me, he's not consistently brilliant. And I admire that about him because he's willing to try stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's not a safe filmmaker. He will try stuff. And he's got kind of a journeyman quality to him. He's like, well, I'll try this here. I'll try this here. I'll try this here. Um, 
And he's not been so worried about box office or critical reputation. Um, I doubt he could get away with his career now, you know, given how focus group and corporately driven studios are. But because he started making films in 66, 65, he's been able to have a really varied and interesting career where I think he's pretty much done what he's wanted to do and made the films he's wanted to make. And some have hit, some have not. Um, the yeah. worst. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's definitely, uh, like you said, an, an outsider. I mean, he, yeah. there's even that scene where he meets up with uh, Lee Marvin at a restaurant or something and they're looking at the script, the first script, and Lee Marvin's like, what do you think? He's like, I think it sucks. And it's producers like, you never say that in Hollywood. You always say, we're rewriting it, right? You always bullshit yeah. your way. And Marvin was like, it does, you know, eventually it does suck. Yeah. You're going to make it better, right? I think he was on. I think he was honest. I think Marvin respected that. And again, there was a difference in age, a difference in background, a difference in star, stardom. But Marvin saw something in Borman. And jo- didn't Borman see some? He saw pain throughout his eyes when they were having a conversation. And he knew well, this is where we need to go. Yeah. So Borman, so Borman was the first time was describing the script, and and he agreed, and Marvin agreed. It's not so great. But and then the producer said, "You got to meet him again." And the reason Marvin met him again, according to Borman, he said, "When I was describing the betrayal of Lee Marvin by his wife and and friend." in my mind popped my mom's own betrayal of my dad. My, my mom had an affair with someone and my dad knew about it. And he said, I think Marvin caught that I had emotion in my voice when I was referring to it. Right. And, and, and so when they got together again, that's when Marvin started sharing, I have an emotional connection to this character too. And, and off they went and they, they kind of talked about the script to the point where they realized that the script we now have, we're throwing out the window and Marvin threw it out the window. Uh, he came fluttering down and, and, and Borman claims that maybe a young Mel Gibson was walking by and picked up the pages because oh, he did yeah. a version of point, the story of point blank in 99 called payback, which is quite terrible, <laughs> but based <laughs> largely on the first script that they kind of threw to the side. Yeah. yeah. And Marvin was all in, like you said, we're talking about the, the demiurge power. Marvin was like, we're going to get Angie Jick- Dickinson. You're not going right. to fire him this, or I walk. And it was simple That's as that. Right. That's right. So, when power works well indeed and yeah for the audience sometimes it was hard for me to watch it this time because uh some of the characters like mel is the um principal in animal house so it's hard i had to you know fat drunk and stupid is no way to go through life so you know this kind of madcap principal that gets ridiculed and and of course it's not his fault carol o'connor who created the most iconic character Mm -hmm. in tv archie bunker is there and he is kind of like Archie Bunkle a little bit. In he kind movie. of is. I think he's great in this film. He brings a kind of comic zest to the movie. And I, and so the first the first time that Borman shot the scene between Carol O'Connor and Lee Marvin, he said that Lee Mar- Marvin was overpowered by Carol O'Connor. He, Carol O'Connor was so like there and funny and, and to where Marvin just went passive. And you can see it. If you watch that scene, yeah. the first half of it, Marvin's just sitting there and O'Connor's on fire. So he had to reach. Yeah, he has the all scene. the power. He's yeah, like, he has all the power in that. Even though uh, he, Marvin has the guns, <laughs> he shoots the phone. But but then if you see, you can see where where um, Borman reshot it. You can see that the scene shifts suddenly, and you get close ups of Marvin like he's trying to give more power to Marvin. Mm-hmm. All I'm saying is that that Carol O'Connor is great in this film. And you're right, he kind of had a career of, I mean, an iconic TV career with both R.C. Bunker and he, All in the Family, and Heat of the Night. But it's a shame. I mean, I, I really liked him in this movie. Um, John Vernon also plays the police chief who plays Mal, who played in Animal House. He also plays the police chief in Dirty Harry. He's great as a man. He also plays in Outlaw Josie Wales. He plays the, uh, the, the, the soldier who's kind of on the side of Josie Wales. He has a great, deep, commanding voice that makes you think he knows what he's talking about, but the more he talks, the more idiotic he becomes. So he's kind of perfect for this, for this character in point blank. Yeah. Cause he's trying to be philosophical about why he betrays his friend. And then he's like, Oh, it was either him, him or I, I owed money to the mob. So he had to go. It's simple. Exactly. There's no, no, no pathos in it or anything no. like that. He's just a scumbag. So yeah. sleeping with his wife and all oh, that. Stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, awesome. This has been incredible. For the audience, I'll have this on the show notes for sure. Get Eric's book. There's so much more. And when you watch it, uh, so much is going to make sense about the movies you watch today. The legacy of Lee Marvin and just filmmaking, Gnosticism, trauma, how important we all have to follow our trauma or else we'll end up like uh, like Walker, walking <laughs> through existence, yes. uh, like Ghost. Uh, and it's great. And well, as always, Eric, it's great to have you. And I, God, we look forward to your book on uh, the, on Lynch. On uh, well, Walt Whitman's the next one, but that's oh, Walt Whitman. Be, oh, he's great too. I'm doing a biography of Walt Whitman. It's like three years away, but that's my big project now. That's what I'm working on now. Um, Eraserhead. Well, I'm all of it. All of it. Oh no, the Eraserhead's not mine. I, I, I am. Um, I yeah, we have to look forward. I can't remember the guy who wrote it. Um, the BFI Classics is putting out. A small book like mine, okay. or Eraserhead. Um, yeah, the BFI classics are great. Each book's on one film; they're about ninety pages, and the one on Eraserhead's coming out before too long. Um, mm. But I, I'm I'm going back to literature myself for for my next book. I'm doing doing the poetry of Walt Whitman and a big old biography that um, I'll be at work on for the next very long while. <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah. Walt Whitman's amazing. What else can we say? Well, we'll have to talk about him, maybe yes, talk about Zardos and so much more. I so. hope so, Miguel. Such a pleasure to chat. Um, glad to be on your show again. Always great to have you. Thank you.